Hi, Stephen. Good to be with you. Well, thanks for taking the time. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Stephen Kinzer, longtime uh, reporter for The New York Times. You're no longer doing that, but you are teaching at Brown University, and you are uh, you seem to continue to write books. Uh, we're going to talk about one of them. Uh, the one we're going to talk about is actually not your most recent book, but I want to mention that one because I, I heard you interviewed about it on Fresh Air. It sounds uh, fascinating. It's about the CIA's mind control problem. Uh, I mean, mind control program. It was kind of problematic in some ways. For example, they would uh, give LSD to people without telling them. Uh, but anyway, that's called Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. The book we're going to talk about today uh, was was published a few years before that. It's called The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War. Uh, and I just, I kind of happened upon it on Audible and found it engrossing and very important. I, it seems very relevant to the, uh, the, the current world, even though these are two people who did their work, mainly, uh, their most important work in the 1950s. John Foster Dulles was secretary of state at the same time his brother Alan was head of the CIA. Uh, and you know, when I say it's relevant to the to the current world, I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, on any given day, the CIA uh, may be launching a drone strike and killing someone somewhere. And, and I, I probably won't hear about it, but th that happens. Um, and uh, one thing your book is about is how the CIA early in its history uh, became an organization that does things like that. You might not guess it from the name, Central Intelligence Agency. You might think they just gather intelligence. But uh, they've been very interventionist. The book is also about, in a way, how our foreign policy became so interventionist. Uh, so, for example, in the not very distant future, we decided to funnel a bunch of weapons into Syria, where there was an internal conflict that I think our weapons probably turned into a larger conflict. Um, the CIA was also involved in that, but that's not so much my point. My point is that we continue uh, to do a lot of intervening, and your book is, among other things, about a, a, a kind of important period in our history where we, uh, where that tendency was uh, became pretty robust. So before we, uh, before I ask you a question, is there anything you you'd add to that or, or, or amend uh, by, by way of uh, what I said? I tell my students at Brown that the development of American empire could be seen as coming in three different phases. First, you have continental empire inside North America. Then in the period following 1898, you have the period of what you could call overseas empire. And then finally, after the end of the Second World War, the period of global empire. Now, in the earlier period, before the Second World War, the United States intervened in countries very directly. We would just land Marines on the shore and turn the place into a protectorate or even take it as a colony. But after the Second World War, that was no longer possible. There was a new force in the world, which was the Red Army, the Soviet Union. We never knew if we landed the Marines on some foreign shore whether they would do the same thing. And next thing you know, we're spiraling into nuclear war. So we had to find another way to continue to shape events around the world. We, we never stepped back and said, well, we're not gonna be invading countries, so I guess we should let other countries go their own way. We decided we still wanted to control them, but the old method wasn't gonna work. And the new method was covert action. The agency that directed it was the CIA. Okay, so uh, the, these brothers, the Dulles brothers are just the perfect vehicle for telling this whole story. Why don't we talk about them a little? They weren't exactly born uh, in an underprivileged, uh, you know, environment. Their their uh, grandfather was Secretary of State. Their uncle was Secretary of State, and then John Foster Dulles became Secretary of State. What would you say about them, their upbringing, uh, and and maybe some differences between the two of them by way of setting the story up? First of all, they grew up in a very religious household. Their father, their uncle, their grandfather, they were all strict Calvinists and clergymen. So uh, what this imparted, I think, to the Dulles brothers was a, a sense of Calvinist morality that uh, is based around two principles. 
Uh, one is that the world is divided between good and evil. This is not a view that people in every culture have. People in many cultures think, well, all of us and everything is partly good and partly evil. That comes out in different proportions according to different situations. The Dulles brothers didn't believe that. That's not the Protestant ethic. It's that there's good and that there's evil. And the other piece of that is that good people, good Christians, are not allowed simply to stay home and lament the fact that there's evil in the world. They have to go out and redeem the world. So this is easily translatable from the religious sphere into the political sphere. You feel that there are certain nations and leaders and trends in the world that are evil. And you feel that it's your duty to go out and cleanse the world of these evils. So that was certainly a big strain in the upbringing of the Dulles brothers. Now, another one, has to do with their uh, extraordinary family to which you just referred. So when the Dulles brothers were little kids living up in Watertown, New York, uh, their grandfather used to take them off on fishing trips and canoe rides in the Great, Great Lakes and uh, nearby rivers. And on all those days, he would explain his own past history. What was that? He went west with the frontier. He fought Native Americans. He built himself a little empire. He became a newspaper man. He campaigned for Abraham Lincoln. He became politically influential. He became rich. He came to Washington. Essentially, he was preparing the dullest kids to do in the world what he had done inside the United States. Uh, and he was so infatuated with his young grandchildren that he brought them to Washington for months at a time. Uh, during the winter. And there they would have dinner with William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson and uh, Grover Cleveland and all these glittering figures. So a second shaping aspect of the Dulles brothers uh, was their upbringing in this elite world. They not only learned how those people thought, but also the style with which they behaved and how they looked at the world. And if there's one other uh, factor that fed into shaping the character of John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. Uh, it was their intimate uh, service to America's corporate elite. They were both lawyers at this legendary law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. It was not a regular law firm that did things like normal law firms do. It had a specialty, and that was pr promoting the interests of American corporations in foreign countries. Virtually every major multinational corporation in America retained Sullivan and Cromwell. So this gave the Dulles brothers, who were lawyers there, the idea that American foreign policy and the good of American corporations were essentially the same thing. So they always saw the world from the perspective of Wall Street. They, their views never evolved over their lives. What they believed when they were 10 was what they believed when they died. And they were moved by a kind of zeal that typified the Cold War narrative, which was probably one of the most powerfully developed narratives in modern history. Right. And there's uh, there's an interesting story from uh, that part of that, the early part of, I guess, John Foster Dulles's career when he's a fairly young lawyer at that firm and has, has to do with Cuba. Of course, at the end of the, uh, near the end of the book, we have the Bay of Pigs, uh, with with Alan Dulles at least nominally in charge of that fiasco and that being kind of an unfortunate uh, capstone on his career. But but then way earlier, at the beginning of the 20th century, as if I recall correctly, John Foster Dulles has clients at his law firm who could benefit from the U.S. taking some kind of firmer hand in Cuba, which at that point was, I don't know, some kind of protectorate or something or other. I don't, I don't have the details. So he calls his uncle, who is the secretary of state, right, and encourages him to do some sort of meddling that he actually does, right? Yeah, that's quite a story. And it really, as you suggest, sets the tone for not only Dulles's legal career, but his whole career, his whole life, of what he did both as a lawyer and as secretary of state. So the episode to which you refer took place in 1917. This is when Dulles is still a young lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, Cuba was uh, effectively run as an American protectorate. There had been an election in Cuba. 
And the Liberal Party, which wanted to limit the amount of land that foreigners could own in Cuba and place restrictions on the size of plantations, uh, won the election. So the sugar companies, United Fruit, and the other American mining and transport industries in Cuba all did what big American transnationals did in those days when they ran into trouble. They went to Sullivan and Cromwell and said, you got to fix this for us somehow. Make sure that the people that won the election don't get to come to power. So the case was given to young John Foster Dulles. He got on the train and went to visit Uncle Bert. Uncle Bert happened to be Secretary of State Robert Lansing. Uh, He explained the situation and Uncle Bert asked him, what do you think we should do? And so uh, Foster Dulles suggested to take two American warships and send them to the north and south coasts of eastern Cuba and land Marines to show those people who won the election that they should stop protesting and demanding to come to power and they should stand down. And that's exactly what happened. The next day, warships were dispatched. And sure enough, the liberal rebellion was put down. Those soldiers stayed in Cuba for several years until things were calmed down. Then they could leave and American soldiers didn't have to come back until the next time it happened. But this shows you the intimate link between public and private power. The lawyer for the American corporations who feel themselves threatened by the outcome of an election in Cuba is consulting intimately with his uncle, who's the secretary of state. And together, they decide how Cuba should develop as a nation. Okay. So to, to jump ahead, and, I, and I, I regret jumping ahead because there's a lot of fascinating material we skip about the, the development of the two brothers, how different they are. Uh, you know, John Foster is this kind of uh, doer, moralistic guy. Uh, Alan, much more gregarious. Uh, a ladies' man to a shocking extent, with total disregard for his marital vows, which I had I had no idea of. Uh, a great seeker of adventure, in a way, I guess. In a way, I guess it's well. In some ways, it is and isn't natural that Alan is the one who became kind of the spy master. But in any event, that that becomes eventually kind of the division of labor. And uh, before we we talk about their uh, their their doings. Uh, In the Eisenhower administration, talk a little about the birth of the CIA, which Alan had something to do with. It had a precursor during World War II, a precursor organization. And uh, and then it it it, uh, you know, and Truman didn't apparently conceive of its mission. It was formally created on his watch, if I recall correctly, the CIA. He didn't conceive of its mission as being interventionist. He, he, he thought it should just be an intelligence gathering organization. But anyway, t- talk about the, this, this part of its birth, and then we'll, we'll move on to some of the early uh, Eisenhower administration interventions. During the Second World War, the United States had a very active covert action uh, group. It was called the OSS, the uh, Office of Strategic Services. And it was, it was sending agents and running operations all over Europe and around the world in East Asia uh, and far beyond. Uh, so the war ended. Um, Alan Dulles was on his way from his wartime post as OSS uh, station chief in Switzerland to his new post as OSS station chief in Germany right after the war, when a shocking piece of news came from Washington, which was that President Truman has abolished the OSS. He doesn't believe there's a need for an intelligence service that does covert action in peacetime. So poor Alan Dulles and those hundreds of OSS agents were suddenly back in their old lives again. These were guys who had been living on the edge of danger and sending people off onto clandestine missions, parachuting behind enemy lines who might never come back. Now they're back in their white shoe law firms, their investment banking houses in uh, New York City. They're back being the rich kids that they started being before the war. And they were bored stiff. They would spend hours, and this includes Alan Dulles, sitting around reminiscing about the old days. Alan pretended he was writing a book about adventures so they could talk. He never wrote the book. It was just a way to uh, get through the ache, the pain of having lost this tremendously exciting life like those pilots in the Battle of Britain 
who never knew if they were going to come back alive. And suddenly they're back being milkmen up somewhere in the Midlands. It was a shock. And they kept plotting about ways to get back into the game. Meanwhile, promoting the idea of the growing Soviet threat and indeed Stalin's threatening actions accelerated the process by which Truman was made to reconsider his decision. So Alan Dulles co-authored a piece of legislation, a bill called the National Security Act. That was passed by Congress in 1947. Under that bill, the Central Intelligence Agency was created. So uh, Truman was president then. He later wrote that he had never intended it to be what he called a cloak and dagger agency. Now, Truman did use the CIA for covert action. For example, uh, it had a very active role in swinging the uh, Italian election of 1948 in favor of the party that the U.S. was uh, promoting. Um, But Truman always drew the line at overthrowing governments. He never wanted the CIA to be used for that. Now, there's one important aspect in Alan Dulles's uh, design for this new agency, the CIA. In one way, it was radically different from every other uh, secret service in all other Western countries, and particularly different from the British Secret Service, which was always considered to be the gold standard and showed the way to do things. Here's the way it was different. In all those other secret services, like the one in Britain, there's a very sharp division between the analysts, the people who look at the world and see what's happening and think what should be done, and the covert operatives who actually go out and do covert deeds. The idea is that if you put them together, there's always going to be a push to think that every situation in the world requires covert action because we're the same people. We want to do it. So it was always considered important to keep those separate so you don't fall into that temptation. It was Alan Dulles's idea to combine them, that the analysts should also be the covert operatives. And it produced exactly the syndrome that the British and others had worried about, which is that every piece of analysis naturally leads to this desire by these compulsive activists to do something to shape events rather than just observe and report on them. Right. So every situation you assess ter- is assessed as a dire situation, basically. I mean, um, yeah, there's there's no percentage at the CIA for saying things are OK and we should lie back. Right. You are always judged by how many operations you were running. That's why I call it compulsive activism. These people were never able to sit back and allow history to unfold. They always thought they knew better and uh, imposed themselves recklessly in many countries. And when you think about it, that is such a fundamental corruption of your like perceptual apparatus, your your means of just observing the world and trying to assess it. But it persists to this day, right? This this institutional uh, 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 is it basically the same? Have, have there been any meaningful reforms? I would say that the general concept of threat inflation is still very strong in Washington. There's just no percentage, whether you're in the Pentagon, whether you're in the CIA, or whether you're in Congress, in saying, actually, our biggest threats are not coming from Russia and Iran and Venezuela. We have threats inside our country. These are the big ones. You you never get anywhere by doing that, where you make political haze to say, I don't think we're doing enough to strangle Cuba. We should be doing more. Hey, let's let's see. What can we do in Syria? Everything we've done, it's not enough. I want to do more than the other guys to crush the evil that's out there. There's no percentage for saying, let's calm down and realize we're strong. We're not under imminent threat. We should be dealing with our real problems because that doesn't produce uh, the benefits, including great financial benefits, that the threat inflation uh, attitude always uh, offers. Okay, so one of the uh, early threats that the Dulles brothers decide needs addressing, and as you emphasize, the fact that you have brothers at, you know, on the one hand, uh, running the State Department, on the other running the CIA, you know, gives gives them a, their collective voice a kind of uh, unique power. Uh, we've we've never had that. We've never had that since. Uh, so when they decide something needs doing, there's a pretty good chance they're going to be able to persuade Eisenhower. I want to talk later about the extent to which he did or didn't need persuading for this kind of thing, but. 
uh, in any event, they, they had a lot of uh, combined power. And they, they decide that uh, Guatemala early on uh, is a place that, that uh, needs fixing. Now, I forget, wh- which came first? Was it Gu- Guatemala was 54, Iran was 53? Very good. You get a good, you get an A for that. Will I get a good grade in your course? Let's talk about Guatemala first anyway, because it's a more straightforward connection between American commercial interest and intervention. So, uh, first of all, you're quite right to say that the uh, fact of having two siblings, brothers, running the overt and the covert sides of American foreign policy was unique uh, in American history. Uh, and they function together like um, I read recently that the jaws of a snake are actually not connected in the back so that they can open really wide. They're, that was like John Foster Bellows and Alan Bellows. They, they had two different jobs, but they functioned together. So the top jaw was the uh, public side. That was where Foster Dulles would make the diplomatic uh, moves that would set the stage for a, a revolution or a coup. And then the bottom jaws would be Alan Dulles and the CIA doing the covert action on the ground. Uh, it's a dangerous arrangement, and it proved that way uh, for the Dulles brothers because Under normal circumstances, if you were going to do an operation in, say, Guatemala, you'd ask the CIA Guatemala people and the State Department Guatemala people to get together and talk about it and kick around ideas. But with these two guys, there were no meetings. There was no discussion. They saw the world in the same way. And all it took was a wink and a nod for the two of them. And they decided that's what we have to do. So there was never any serious reflection on the long-term potential consequences of these operations. Guatemala is a classic example of a coup that the United States plan, and particularly the Dulles brothers plan, specifically uh, motivated by a desire to protect a particular American corporate interest. So the United Fruit Company had been a major client of Sullivan and Cromwell. John Foster Dulles handled the account personally. In the 1930s, he went to Guatemala to negotiate a 99-year contract with the Guatemalan dictator for United Fruit that in, uh, included tremendous giveaways of na- national natural resources and uh, tax advantages to United Fruit. Alan Dulles had also been in Guatemala as a lawyer for United Fruit. They owned United Fruit stock. Uh, and they owned, they owned the stock at the time of the intervention? Uh, you know, I believe they did. Yeah, because yeah. in those okay. days, divestment yeah. was not even a thought. So they okay. were all uh, big stockholders and probably wouldn't have seen any uh, any conflict. So uh, the Dulles brothers worked directly for United Fruit. Alan Dulles went into the CIA when Truman was still president, not as director, as a deputy. In that capacity, one of the first things he did was propose, we have to overthrow the government of Guatemala, because it's bothering the United Fruit Company. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, way that American, uh, the American security establishment conceptualized these interventions. So it's, it's the uh, Land Reform Act in Guatemala affecting United Fruit that sets United Fruit into a panic. And that leads them to go to uh, the U.S. government. In this case, they don't have to go very far because it's the Dulles brothers themselves. So they're going to themselves in a sense and asking for help. Now, inside the American foreign policy process, the motive morphs. We actually don't overthrow governments to protect big corporations. We do it because those governments we suspect are in league with communists or our enemies. How do we know that? Because they're bothering a big American corporation. So without the corporation being bothered, the country never even comes on the radar screen in Washington. But we convince ourselves that we're not doing it to protect that company. We're only doing it because the troubles that company has had prove that the government in that country is evil and and is against us. So the Truman administration immediately rejected Alan Dulles's proposal for an intervention to overthrow the government of Guatemala. In fact, Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, memorably said that there was absolutely nothing that could happen in Latin America, anywhere, no matter what it was, that would be serious enough to require an American intervention to overthrow a government. So Alan Dulles was tapped down 
Then in 1952, Eisenhower was elected in early 1953. Um, the Dulles brothers came into power. And one of their first projects was to go back to something they had not been able to do earlier. Now, the United Fruit came to Sullivan and Cromwell and said, we have a problem in a country and you got to solve it. And that's what Sullivan and Cromwell did, but they couldn't solve the problem. And Alan Dulles and Foster Dulles never forgot that. They still wanted to make good on their commitment to United Fruit to get rid of that government in Guatemala. And when they came into power in the 50s, that's what they did. Yeah. Now, I guess what they would say in their defense uh, was, well, the 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 Arbenz regime, the Guatemalan government uh, was going to, uh, you know, expropriate. They were going to steal uh, the land rightfully belonging to United Fruit. They were going to take possession, I gather, of land that wasn't under cultivation. Apparently, United Fruit just owned a ton of land, most of which they weren't doing any anything with. The government wanted to take that and and uh, I guess give it to peasants or something. What I thought was really clever of the government, I thought this was funny. They said, we're not stealing the land. We're going to pay you exactly what you said the land was worth when you filed your tax returns, <laughs> right? And, and, and uh, th that, I, I thought that was genius. It wasn't enough to force, to keep our bins from being the victim of a coup, but it was clever. You're absolutely right. The uh the Guatemalan Land Reform Act was modeled in part after the Homestead Act in the United States, aimed at opening up new lands for settlement. United Fruit had some hundreds of thousands of acres of the best agricultural land in the country that it wasn't using. And so under the Land Reform Act, uh, it was required to sell that land at, uh, to the government, and which then began slicing it up and giving it to people who had no land and no way to grow food. Uh, but it wasn't just the nature of that land reform law. It was the very fact that the government in a Central American country was trying to impose its will on a big American corporation. I think the Dulles brothers felt that not only was this an intolerable situation for United Fruit in Guatemala, but it had much bigger implications. If the countries that produce raw materials, whether it's uh, bananas or oil or anything else, are able to set the conditions and the prices by which those natural resources are sold, then the whole system by which the world economy runs falls apart because the consuming countries no longer have the absolute power to dictate to the producing countries. So it was the potential example of Guatemala, uh, an elected government trying to uh, assert its power over a big American corporation that I think... Uh, uh, terrified the Dulles brothers just as much as the particular situation. Okay. Um, do you think Eisenhower believed that uh, the communist, the, the anti-communism rationale was a valid and important one? I mean, one thing that, you know, the, the Cold War hysteria had been heating up. We're now at, at kind of almost the height of the McCarthy, of M Joseph McCarthy's uh, rhetorical power in the Senate. Um, uh, do you think Eisenhower convinced himself in all of these cases? Yeah, this is this is vital Cold War policy. We don't know what Eisenhower thought about covert action because he never spoke about it. He never admitted that he carried it out. Uh, however, we also know that Eisenhower was a fervent believer in covert action. Um, and there were some, a couple of very important reasons for this. One is that Eisenhower, of course, had been commander of Allied troops uh, during the Second World War in Europe. We now know that covert operations played a big role in that war, not just stealing the Nazi code machine, but all kinds of uh, uh, fake uh, tanks that were made out of balloons and all kinds of strange operations where uh, documents were placed on dead bodies that were allowed to wash ashore in certain places. We didn't know that, but Eisenhower, would probably have emerged from the Second World War with a great appreciation for what covert action can do. But there's another reason why I think Eisenhower was particularly disposed toward covert action. And it was this. As the commander of Allied forces in Europe, Eisenhower had had to send kids off to die by the thousands. This very much weighed on him. When he spoke about it, he became emotional. I even saw a clip where he started to weep when thinking about D-Day and the grandchildren that will never be born and the families that will be shattered forever. He, it really affected him. And with covert action, he thought he had a way 
to continue shaping the course of the world without war. So he would see an operation like the Guatemala coup as a peace project. He would think it was the alternative to war. Now, if we had him here in front of us and said to him, thanks a lot for Guatemala, 200,000 peasants were slaughtered by some Guatemalan soldiers over the next 30 years in a civil war that you helped set off with that coup. How do you feel about that? I think he would say, all right, we now see that those coups, those covert action operations had huge unimagined consequences. But please forgive me because when I was alive, we had never had covert operations. So we didn't know what the long-term results were gonna be. You guys are still doing it in the 21st century. You should be knowing better and learning from my example that when you violently interfere in the politics of another country, you're doing something like releasing a wheel at the top of a hill. You can let it go, but you have absolutely no control over how it bounces or where it's ultimately going to end up. And and Guatemala is a tragic example. Okay, so so let's uh, talk about a case where the the ramifications are, are very evident today. Uh, the thing that actually happened a year before the Guatemalan coup, and I should say, I, I, I'm sorry that time forces us to skip over all the details of the Guatemalan coup. It's interesting. It's, it, it's, not, it's not the kind of minimalistic coup uh, where, you know, three soldiers walk in and, and put a, tell the president to, uh, to step aside. It's like there are, there are war planes and, 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 it, and it, it's, there's, a, there's, there's an uprising. The, the, um, but, but so in Iran in 1953, the main commercial interest immediately threatened uh, by the government's plan to, to nationalize a, a corporate asset is, is British oil. But, but I learned from your book that actually uh, the Dulles brothers had kind of an ax to grind with the Mossadegh regime, which is the democratically elected regime that was deposed in favor of a guy who turned into a brutal dictator, the Shah of Iran. Um, Dating back to a few years early, or in, in their in their corporate uh, law doings, right? So, the Dulles brothers were very actively involved in Iran, uh, particularly friend- friendly with the new Shah, who emerged after the Second World War. Alan Dulles actually brought the Shah to New York and presented him at the Council on Foreign Relations, essentially saying, "This is our guy in Iran." And he gave a great speech about how he wanted all American businesses to come and our resources are virgin and unexploited and we're not going to have taxes and we're not going to bother you. Um, and But uh, Alan Dulles had a, a real punch in the face when he uh, got involved with the Iran that was becoming democratic. So while the Shah was back on the peacock throne, democracy was also returning to Iran, which had been the goal of the constitutional revolution way back at the beginning of the 20th century. And this figure of Mohammed Mossadegh had emerged as the popular leader. Now in Iran, if you were going to promote democracy or nationalism, that could only mean one thing, which is we want to take back control of our oil. Iran is sitting on an ocean of oil, but by the 1950s, uh, that oil was still entirely owned by one British company, and which was in turn owned mainly by the British government. The financial agent for that oil company was something called the Schroeder Bank, which was a client of Sullivan and Cromwell. Alan Dulles was on the board of the Schroeder Bank. Uh, so uh, when he got to Iran, he came, and Alan Dulles came first as a lawyer representing a group of American engineering companies that wanted to launch a massive national development project, which would put Americans in control of projects all over Iran. Uh, it, he final, Alan Dulles finally got the shot to sign that contract. But then Mossadegh led opposition in the parliament and they killed it. So that was the biggest success of Alan Dulles's legal career, destroyed by Mossadegh. Then when Mossadegh became prime minister, of Iran, he proceeded to uh, propose to Congress successfully a bill to nationalize Iranian oil. Again, you have the same two problems. Number one, the Dulles brothers see the problem of oil supply and control of Iran, but they also see a much larger problem, which is that if Iran is going to seize control of its own oil, it means that Poor countries all over the world can start seizing control of the resources under their soil or on their soil. 
And that is not going to be a positive development for the clients of Sullivan and Cromwell. Right. So the uh, so the, the the coup happens, and uh, you know the the when I'm alluded to current day ramifications, I'm of course talking about the fact that the reign of the Shah inspired a revolution in 1979 that brought uh, to power an Islamist regime that, as people may have heard, uh, the U.S. isn't on entirely friendly terms with. I, I don't. I don't know how, I mean, it, it's not surprising that it would be hard to get off on the right foot with the post-revolutionary regime, given that we installed the brutal dictator they were, that the revolution uh, targeted. But I don't really know to what extent that accounts for uh, whatever antipathy there may have been to the U.S. Uh, coming at, right out of the revolution. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. So uh, the Shah, who we placed back on the Peacock throne in 1953, ruled with increasing repression for 25 years. His repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. Uh, as far as we were concerned, the Americans, the signal moment of that revolutionary process was, of course, the hostage taking in, in Tehran, in which American diplomats were held hostage for 444 days. Now, uh, that episode, which I'm old enough to remember, was portrayed in the United States as just an example of the savage nihilism of those Iranian maniacs, because they had no reason to do this. Later on, a number of them wrote essays about why they did it, and they all said the same thing. They said, here it was, 1979, the Shah has been overthrown by a popular revolution just like he was 25 years earlier, the same Shah. But last time, CIA agents working in the basement of the U.S. Embassy organized a coup and brought him back. Now that same Shah has fled and he's been taken in by the United States. So we thought to ourselves, history is about to repeat itself. CIA agents working in the basement of the U.S. Embassy are going to stage a coup and bring the Shah back. What makes us think that? because it already happened once. Now, Americans had no idea this had ever happened. That's why during the hostage crisis, we thought of the Iranians as acting like blind savages. It was only much later, and only uh, not even loudly enough for most Americans to hear it, uh, did it become clear why they did all this. And I could just add that it wasn't just the hostage crisis that uh, resulted from our 1953 coup and the 1979 uprising that uh, just finally overthrew the Shah. That 1979 revolution also attracted the attention of Iran's biggest enemy, Saddam Hussein, in next door Iraq. We were so angry at Iran, we started a military partnership with Saddam. President Reagan sent a personal envoy to meet twice with Saddam Hussein and ask him what we could do to help him. That envoy was Donald Rumsfeld. That's what began our death embrace with Saddam. It spiraled down into the disaster that uh, unfolded there. That revolution of 1979 in Iran also terrified the Soviets. It was one of those rare moments in the Cold War that both Washington and Moscow felt they had lost. The Soviets were terrified that radical Islam would now start creeping in through the Muslim republics of the Soviet Union. That was one of the reasons they sent troops into Afghanistan, which brought us into Afghanistan and helped us spiral down into the Afghanistan quagmire. So a lot of history came from a few weeks in Iran by a couple of CIA agents in the summer of 1953. Okay. So uh, as, the, as the 50s wear on, uh, there continue to be interventions. They they increase. They tend not to be the clear cut quote successes that Guatemala and Iran seem to be at least in the short run. And I, I'm afraid we're you know we're not going to have time to talk about all of these. L let me mention a few and then uh, ask you to kind of kind of maybe pick one to talk about uh, uh, within a certain framing. So anyway. Uh, not necessarily in in historical order, um, 
we we intervene in Tibet. I, I was not aware, real. I mean, I I had heard once I heard somebody online call the Dalai Lama a CIA CIA asset, and I said, well, "What are you talking about?" And it turned out that in the distant past, decades and decades ago, he did receive uh, a little CIA money. Uh, that that was um, and that was a part of an intervention that I didn't realize had had cost uh, a lot. I, I think tens of thousands of lives in Tibet. Uh, that that uh, failed to to um, you know to take Tibet back from China or, or whatever it was intended to do. There was Indonesia where we um, kind of uh, tried to intervene, helped create uh, a certain amount of uh, chaos and and uh, destabilization. Didn't achieve our goals. Kind of similarly in the Congo, I would say. Uh, I, I want to let you you pick one of those to talk about, but I'd like you to pick one that illustrates a particular theme that I, I thought was important in your in your book. It's it's the way that I mean, first of all, we viewed the entire world as in play, right? I mean, and, and any nation that that hadn't uh, kind of uh, reassured us that they were on their so our side, not the Soviet side, we tended to view as a threat even if it wasn't evident that they were on the Soviet side, even if they were part of the so-called non-aligned movement and, and so on. And, and this, uh, so, so we tended to start worrying in a way that sometimes became a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Uh, John Foster Dulles in particular, and this may reflect his, his, the nature of his worldview, was a kind of, you're either with us or against us guy. You know, the, the same phrase that George W. Bush used about uh, the war on terror. And so it seems to me that in some cases, and I want you to talk about whichever one you think best illustrates this, we would take a nation that wasn't particularly leaning uh, toward the, the, the Soviet Union in, in any deeply threatening way, even leaving aside the question of how threatening it would have been if they had you know, totally signed on, right? If some nation halfway around the world had decided to become, uh, become part of the Soviet bloc. But uh, an example where our concern about the possibility of them uh, tilting toward the Soviets wound up pushing them in the direction of the Soviets, right? You're absolutely right that uh, one of the key aspects of Cold War ideology was this uh, Manichaean view, a little bit like uh, Calvinist Protestantism, that, that you, you're either good or you're evil. There's nothing in between. Now, one of the major developments in the world during the 1950s, the Dulles era, was the emergence of what became known as neutralist countries. A lot of countries were colonies, uh, either literal colonies or quasi colonies for many years, and they became independent. They emerged into new life in the 1950s and 60s. Now, these countries had tremendous development challenges. Under colonial periods, they hadn't had many roads, didn't have hospitals, didn't have educational systems, didn't have civil services. And they wanted to concentrate, the leaders of those countries wanted to concentrate their efforts on developing their own countries. And they weren't interested in the Cold War. They were sort of conscientious objectors that they didn't really want to get involved in foreign policy. So this was considered to be uh, a tremendous threat in Washington because the Dulles brothers and Foster Dulles in particular never believed those neutralist leaders. He said they are all actually dupes of the Kremlin. He believed that the Kremlin had set these leaders up and told them, don't say you're communists. Don't say you're working for the Kremlin. Pretend that you're just a local nationalist leader who wants to have friends in Washington and in Moscow. And then when the right moment comes, we're going to call you. And then in one day, you're going to turn your country communist. So uh, he actually told uh, Prince Sihanouk in Cambodia, one of these neutralist leaders who protested this policy, uh, our policy is global now. Neutralism is immoral. He actually considered the neutralists more dangerous than the communists, just like he considered Khrushchev worse than Stalin, because it was all part of a trick, as uh, Dulles saw it. So take Indonesia as an example. The post-independence leader of, in Indonesia was Sukarno, very uh, fat, flamboyant, fascinating figure. Um, uh, one of the founders of what we now call the Third World Movement, uh, and a great believer in neutralism, which he called rowing between two reefs, a wonderfully Indonesian way of putting it. Uh, Sukarno came to Washington 
everybody loved him. He addressed Congress. He had a ticker tape parade. There were articles and editorials about what a wise man he was. He went to Niagara Falls. He went to visit uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, He had a great time in America. He went to Disneyland. Um, Then after he went home for a while, he decided he should also visit China. Oh, this caused an eruption in the United States. Our so-called friend stabbed us in the back. This is how a guest treats you. He was saying, I'm just visiting another country. And he said, when I visited America, the Chinese didn't insult me. Um, We then decided we can't live with Sukarno. He is flirting with the communists. So uh, we started out with a plan to try to overthrow him. That turned out to be difficult. So we decided, why don't we foment a civil war in the Congo? And that's what, I'm sorry, why don't we foment a civil war in Indonesia? So you've got all these islands and you have some dissident colonels. Let's get in touch with them. This is what we did. We funded them. We dropped huge amounts of weaponry to them. And we promoted a civil war that was aimed at either breaking apart Indonesia so there would be a a new country that would be pro-American or maybe overthrowing Sukarno or maybe forcing him to do what we wanted. It all turned out as a disaster. It never worked. We were unloading giant arms shipments on the beaches of little islands. It became so obvious what was happening. And finally, the whole ruse fell apart when uh, one CIA pilot dropped into a coconut tree after his uh, plane was shot down and he was carrying all kinds of documents explaining all the places he had bombed inside Indonesia. So that's uh, that's not best practices, by the way, when you're staging a covert intervention. To- you're, su- you're supposed to be flying <laughs> sterile, they call it, not have 30 documents on you, which this <laughs> pilot did. In any case, um, the Indonesia coup greatly destabilized that country and set the stage for a violent clash that emerged in uh, the mid 1960s in which over a million people were slaughtered. Uh, that was a delayed response in part to America's intervention there in the 1950s. So uh, these coups, as you point out, sometimes seem to be successful. But I can tell you, even in a case like Indonesia, where it didn't work out, there were no regrets because at least the Dulles brothers had accomplished one of their goals, which was to prevent the successful consolidation of a leftist regime or a neutralist regime or a regime that followed economic and political practices of which we didn't approve. It was very important for them that even if we couldn't overthrow those governments, we had to prevent them from succeeding. Yeah. And and one of the Dulles brothers, uh, you know, again, by way of framing seeming uh, failure as success, said about Tibet after we had helped get, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 more people killed or something, uh, Well, it was still a success because it was bad publicity for China. Um, And, you know, I'll give you another little detail on the Tibet operation, which really shows how differently local people and the CIA view these struggles. So the Tibetans wanted one thing. They wanted independence from China. But we knew that wasn't going to happen. We promoted that war only as a way of making trouble for China, which had nothing to do with Tibet. So at one point, we state we... uh, had what was considered the greatest success of the Tibet operation. One of these Tibetan guerrilla groups that was being sponsored by the CIA um, overran a Chinese convoy and came away with a satchel full of documents that revealed a lot of secrets about the internal workings of the Chinese Communist Party. The CIA was thrilled. It was a huge intelligence bonanza, and they were so grateful to the Tibetans. But the Tibetans were saying, What about us? We don't care about what you find out about the Chinese Communist Party. That's not what we're here for, right? We're here to get independence for Tibet, right? Well, no, not right. So it shows you that the people we relied on were actually misled to thinking that we were supporting their cause when actually we were doing it for our own ulterior motives with a full realization that what we were telling them we were going to help them accomplish would never be accomplished. So in that case, we were kind of disregarding their nationalist aspirations. And and another common uh, problem was to not understand the strength of nationalist aspirations and to conflate the energy of nationalist aspirations with some kind of communist motivation. Possibly the most famous case of that 
is Vietnam. And again, there's something we don't have time to talk about, but it's an, an interesting part of your book how we were in a way set on the path to intervention uh, during uh, under the Eisenhower a- administration. I mean, uh, I hadn't realized that we installed this guy, Jim, uh, to lead uh, Vietnam, kind of a dubious choice since he was a Christian uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a mainly Buddhist country. And then later in the Kennedy administration, when that problem uh, caught up with him, among other problems, and he became very unpopular, we kind of uh, acquiesced in his assassination by way of ushering off the, 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 the stage. But, uh, yeah, go it's ahead. It's actually true. This as DM in Vietnam is the only leader we ever overthrew who we had installed. But I think you're absolutely right to point out one thing about uh, nationalism. I think arguably the greatest misconception that the Dulles brothers had was their complete failure to grasp the nature of third world nationalism. They had such a kind of racist contempt for those people south of the equator that it was difficult for them to understand that these people could feel nationalist passion just like we do. Yeah, they also have emotions. They're also patriotic. This seemed very uh, distant. The Dulles brothers were never able to grasp this. When Sukarno came to the United States, he kept telling Americans, the biggest division in the world is not between the communists and the capitalists. It's between the developed world of communists and capitalists that want to exploit the poor countries and all of us third world nationalists that are emerging. So be on our side. And so we, they saw the division of the world um, only between East and West and never understood that so much nationalist passion in developing countries was real and not the product of somebody pulling a button in the Kremlin. Mm-hmm. OK, so uh, then, you know, the, the uh, I mean, another case of momentum uh, transferring from the Eisenhower administration to, to the Kennedy administration is the aforementioned uh, Bay of Pigs. The, the plan is kind of almost set to go. Uh, Eisenhower encourages Kennedy to do it on the on the on I guess the inaugural uh, on the day of transition, and and Kennedy for whatever reason does it. Complete uh, fiasco. Uh, all this stuff is fascinating reading, uh, and, and I encourage people to read it. But but uh, let's let's I, I want to move to a couple of uh, maybe big picture questions. One is uh, there's an interesting kind of tension in the book. You, you uh, convincingly depict the Dulles brothers as very influential, and uh, one is forced to ask, what if there had been somebody else? Um, what if Dean Acheson had been a secretary of state, who, when he heard about the Bay of Pigs, said, this is nuts? Um, you know, so, so uh, but, but I was going to say, but then at the end, of course, there's, this, there's one question is, but, but, but what, what wasn't Eisenhower, uh, especially in that environment, going to be uh, so pro-intervention that maybe it didn't matter so much. And then there's the second uh, question that uh, that you raise at the end of the book that gets at this kind of debate about, you know, the kind of so-called big man or big person theory of history, as opposed to a view of history that that views these supposedly famous, powerful people as kind of epiphenomenal. They are just manifestations of deeper currents. They don't matter so much. And one thing you say at the end is, to some extent, the Dulles brothers were a natural expression of the mindset of America at the at the time. So I have one more big picture question after this, but uh, if you want to address any of that, go ahead. Well, you asked, would things have been different if some other people had been in those offices? Um, I think maybe yes, uh, for this reason. Um, Eisenhower had to approve all these operations, of course. But he approved them after the Dulles brothers, particularly Alan Dulles, presented him with the situation. And I want to go back to something we said at the beginning. He is speaking not just as the head of an intelligence analysis organization. He is speaking as the head of an organization dedicated to covert action. So the crises in these foreign countries were always presented as being uh, urgent and requiring immediate action. Somebody else might not have uh, done it quite so uh, intently. I also think that the very fact that they were brothers was very dangerous. It meant uh, that you never had to discuss any of these arguments, that uh, nothing had to be thought through. There were no outside uh, voices penetrating into their world. Uh, So I think uh, 
the Dulles brothers definitely were expressions of some deep currents in American society. Uh, I mentioned this good versus evil religiosity, uh, the uh, power of corporate wealth, um, and the terrible fear that uh, the United States was going to lose its position as the moral arbiter of the world. In, in their world, they inflated uh, the situation they faced in a way that I think uh, reflects something deep in the human soul. We all want to feel like we're in the middle of something really big and important. Uh, that's why this crisis is so urgent. Foster Dulles said that communism posed a threat to civilization that had not been posed since the Moors charged out of the Middle East and came into Europe a thousand years ago. So it's a once in a thousand years threat. Well, that certainly makes everybody feel like they're on the cutting edge of history. And I think they worked themselves up into this a feeling some people call presentism, where you think the present is the most crucial moment. Uh, so uh, Eisenhower certainly got sandbagged by them in a lot of ways. But when you get towards the end of the Eisenhower administration, you find Eisenhower even more enthusiastic than they are. At one point, Alan Dulles presented a plan to uh, use arson to burn down uh, sugar fields and sugar uh, centrales in Cuba. And uh, Eisenhower said it wasn't enough. This, he wants something more drastic. You're just fooling around. And he has no hesitation in saying, I want Castro sawed off. So Eisenhower personally did something that as far as we know, no other president has ever done, which is order the assassination of a foreign leader, which he did at least twice, maybe three times during his uh, presidency. So uh, it's certainly true that uh, the Dulles brothers sh helped shape America's approach to the world, but uh, they were reinforcing a view that was already out there. Now, a different uh, pair of CIA director and secretary of state might have tried to challenge some of the uh, stereotypes that were out there. One of the biggest moments could have been when Stalin died in 1953. At the end of that year, the big three, Britain, France, and the U.S., were holding a meeting of foreign ministers in Bermuda. They all, everybody favored the idea of bringing the Soviets in, making it the big four. But Foster Dulles was totally against it. He didn't want to see U.S.-Soviet relations change because Stalin was dead. He thought that didn't make any difference at all. We never sought to explore that. So I think you can make a good case that the origins of the Civil War, uh, of the Cold War, uh, the, the responsibility for the Cold War is shared by both sides. However, once you get past 1953, the responsibility for the Cold War remaining so intense for so long lies largely with the United States, and it's because of processes that the Dulles brothers set in motion. Okay. Uh, final question is kind of, do you think we've learned much of anything? Now, I gather that uh, the CIA itself is in some respects on a shorter leash. Uh, there, there are, there are uh, things it's not supposed to do. It probably has more in the way of reporting uh, requirements to Congress and so on. On, on the other hand, there is still this conflation of responsibilities in, in a single institution. That is to say, on the one hand, do the covert actions. On the other hand, decide whether the situation is dire enough to, to justify covert action. Um, if you want to comment on that, fine, but I, but I mainly have a larger question. It, it's about uh, our, our, our kind of larger uh, failures that transcend institutions uh, uh, which you document. So, so, you know, one manifestation is a failure to understand the power of, of nationalism. Uh, another is the, fa is, is just kind of a tendency toward threat inflation. Often th that involves institutional incentives, as you said, the Pentagon, the CIA, and so on, the media even, uh, as uh, you no doubt know, you're a longtime uh, journalist. The, um, uh, and it seems to me that a lot of that in turn is related to just what I think is in a way the broadest failure of all, which is just to do a good job of putting yourself in the shoes of people in other countries, leaders, uh, the people, uh, broadly and 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 just understanding the way the world looks to them it, it seems to me that we we have learned almost nothing from a narrative that you present 
that is just crying out for us to learn things, you know. You say uh, we should be understanding more, but I can tell you, as you have uh, no doubt observed, Americans don't want to understand things. We want to do things. And this is an, in, is an instinctive part of our national character that has gotten us into a lot of trouble and has frustrated so many of our, our friends, not to mention our, our enemies. Uh, I think there's a strong view still in the United States of, uh, that we are, as Madeleine Albright called us, the indispensable nation. That's the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, it, it has uh, two parts of it. One is that we get to set the rules by which the world must operate. And the other is that we, of course, don't have to obey those rules. The rules are for other countries that are greedy, have selfish interests, so they need rules. But we, being different from all those other countries, uh, don't have to be bound by the rules that we set for others. Sometimes it's difficult for us to understand why it is that other countries don't appreciate this, this system. Now, you also talk about the media. You know, there, there really is a, a closed circle, a pretty closed circle in Washington, in which uh, the congressional staffs, the members of Congress, the think tanks, the defense industry, um, the university uh, programs kind of work together to reinforce a particular narrative. And the narrative is that wherever the U.S. goes, there's liberation, freedom. Where we're not present, there's going to be chains and suffering and chaos. Um, and when you're dissenting from that narrative, you become labeled as, uh, I love the John McCain phrase, you're a wacko bird. I always wanted to get that on a t-shirt. Um, and there's so one thing that is common between this era and the era that we're talking about in the 50s is so little incentive for original thinking. We don't question the assumptions that we've been handed down and what they're all supposed to mean. We had 800 military bases 25 years ago. We still need 800 military bases today. These things never change. And one other uh, point that you made. So you asked about the CIA. It's such a different agency now. Alan Dulles would never have imagined the CIA running a whole war in Afghanistan, paying tens of thousands of Mujahideen. It never was supposed to do that, kidnapping people off streets and sending them off to secret prisons. This is something very new for the CIA. It's really transformed itself and it's gotten tremendously big. But as the CIA has gone off into more and more esoteric areas, the old function of simply fomenting discontent inside countries uh, and making contact with dissidents and promoting them to act against governments we don't like has shifted to other agencies. We have agencies like the uh, National Endowment for Democracy um, and the Agency for International Development that are intensely involved in these programs. Just a couple of months ago, the Agency for International Development approved uh, more than $6 million in grants to people uh, wanting to rebel against the government in Cuba. So uh, here you have an agency that was supposed to be uh, established for international development projects. Now it's taken over some of the CIA's function. So in some ways, it was a little easier when you could point at the CIA as the only agency doing these kind of things. Right uh, Now the responsibility is spread so widely that uh, what they call democracy promotion has replaced the phrase covert action. And, and some of that seems more benign and, and seems to involve less in the way of killing people. And I'm sure sometimes does some good at the same times. I mean, e e even if you look at what happened in, in Ukraine, you know, where, where we kind of, if you remember the case where uh, shortly before their, uh, their president uh, fled during the night for, for fear of his life, we had, you know, Americans, there and and the Russians famously re secretly recorded a, a phone call between two State Department people, kind of planning who the successor would be and so on. Uh, I don't think we killed anybody there, but one could argue that if you trace out the ramifications of that, it, it, again, uh, they were unfortunate. It didn't. We might have been better off just keeping our hands off. We arrogate to ourselves the right to decide what kind of governments people in other countries should have. And I think people, when people talk about the new Cold War between the U.S. and China, this is a big difference between China and the United States and between this Cold War and the previous Cold War. When the U.S. and the Soviets were facing off, both sides believed that they had achieved the perfect society. 
and that there was one way countries should be governed. All countries in the world should be governed the way we're governed. That's the right way to do it. And all the other ways are wrong. That's not the way China looks at the world. It's still the way we look at the world. But China doesn't care what kind of system there is in any other country. So now we're sort of alone as the superpower that believes that all human history has led to our discovery of the perfect form of self-government. And it would be so churlish of us not to share it with others or to force it on them if they're not wise enough to see that they should embrace it. Right. And, And yet there is a belief in America that China does, is intent on replicating its model of government far and wide, although historically, as you note, in recent history, it hasn't had that obsession. And it seems to me this is another case where you could have a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, the Biden administration wants to have a summit of democracies. You hear talk of a league of democracies conceiving the world as a fight between democracy and autocracy and so on. And of course, if you start doing that, if, if you start, if you create a league of democracies and there are certain privileges you extend to members and so on, well, then obviously China is going to want to, uh, to, to secure relations with other countries and is going to be entirely willing uh, to reinforce their authoritarianism uh, in, in order to secure what it sees as, as, as a network of, of allies that's vital to its, uh, its well-being. That's what diplomats are supposed to prevent. And they're always supposed to be thinking about how will the other person respond to what we do? And then how will we respond to their response and on play those things out? But these days, uh, diplomacy seems to be taking a back seat. And in the American political system, promoting diplomacy almost sounds like you're promoting kind of an appeasement or a negative surrender. There's, there is a sense that diplomacy is a form of surrender. And we're America, we're strong. And uh, like it used to be said in those Western movies, that this town ain't big enough for both of us. So there has to be a showdown and good will ultimately triumph. It's a very dangerous way of looking at the world, especially today. Okay, well, thank you so much, Stephen. It's a great book. The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War. And then I gather people can find you on Twitter. It's at it's at Stephen Kinzer, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-I-N-Z-E-R. I am at Robert Ryder on Twitter. Uh, thanks for your work. Keep it up. And we will uh, talk to you down the road, maybe. Look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.